talk about the hypersimplex and the m equals 2 and the 3. Yeah, so um, thanks to the organizers for the invitation and also um, letting me and Mateo sort of <laughs> combine our two talk slots, putting us right after the other. Um, yeah, so I'll just, I'll kind of be giving more details um, about what Mateo talked about. And um, luckily he has already given a lot of the background, um, but just because I know it's the end of the day, maybe your attention span is not as long as it once was, um, I will give much of the background again, but a bit briefer. Um, so if you've forgotten in the last 45 minutes what Mateo said at the beginning of his talk, that is fine. Okay. So um, all I will be focusing on is this mysterious connection um, between the hypersimplex, a polytope many people in the room know and love, and this object um, whose definition is motivated by physics, the m equals 2 amplitudehedron, not a polytope despite the hedron suffix. Okay, so as Matteo said, um, the best way to connect these two objects is to think of them both as the image of a third object under some map. And that third object um, is the totally non-negative Grassmannian, which Matteo has already defined. Um, okay, so I've got some very standard combinatorial notation here. Um, and just to remind you, okay, so in this talk, the Grassmannian GRKN, um, it's the set of k-dimensional subspaces of R to the n, so real Grassmannian here. And I, there are no surprises in the way I'm going to think about this, exactly the same as the way Matteo did. So each um, k-dimensional subspace of R to the n, I'm going to represent by some full rank k by n matrix A, whose row span is the subspace. And I'm just really going to be thinking about matrices, these matrix representatives of this whole talk. Okay, and we have a nice, some nice coordinates called the Pluger coordinates, where I'm just taking determinants of submatrices, um, of full square submatrices in my representative matrices. Um, okay, and the Pluger coordinates are indexed by k element subsets of one through n. I'm always going to denote those by i. Okay, and in particular, so that's the whole real Grassmannian. We care about a special subset, the totally non-negative Grassmannian. Um, introduced in kind of very different language and at different times by Lustig and Posnikov, um, right? So as a reminder, totally non-negative Grassmannian, exactly what it sounds like. It's a subset of the Grassmannian where all the Pluger coordinates are non-negative. And my favorite thing about this space um, is that it has a very natural decomposition um, into little pieces called positroid cells, and this decomposition turns out to be incredibly topologically well-behaved. In fact, it's a, CW, it's a regular CW complex. Um, this is the work of many people, kind of leading up to including Lauren, um, Connie Reach, uh, Karp Gloshen, and Lamb. They proved the whole, the whole thing, uh, Posnikov, et cetera. Um, okay, so these positroid cells are gonna be the pieces we care about. So um, quickly, let me review what they are. So. Um, it's basically, so the positroid cell stratification of the totally non-negative Grassmannian is the stratification you kind of would naturally think about. So um, I'm going to break up the TNN Grassmannian into pieces according to which Pluger coordinates are positive and which ones are zero. So fix my set M. Um, so it's a collection of K element subsets of one through N. These are gonna be the bases of the positroid. Um, and the cell SM is all of those elements of the TNN Grassmannian where my Pluger coordinate is positive if and only if that index I is in the positroid. Um, okay, and I, I guess I should say, right, so not all choices of M actually give you a positroid. So if you choose this subset badly, then um, this set SM will be empty. And in that case, M isn't a positroid. It's just, I don't know, I don't care about it. But as long as SM is non-empty, then I call M a positroid of type KN. And the KN here is reminding me which Grassmannian I'm living in. Okay, um, and just... Just to give you a feeling for these, so what if I want to see, oh, that is not big enough, okay. What if I want to think about the positroid cell where the bases I've chosen are all two element subsets of four except for one, two. Okay, well, these are those subspaces whose representative matrices have the following form. Where a, B, and C are positive real numbers. Okay, so that's one positroid cell. Okay, so 
that's the object in the background. Now I want to apply some maps to it, two very different maps of very different flavors, and then mysteriously we will see that the results are connected. Oh, oh, I guess I, so uh, this is, I guess, implied, but I wanted to say it. Um, so the TNN Grossmannian is the disjoint union over all positroids of all the positroid cells. And like I said before, this um, disjoint union is, is just really nice. Okay. So now I'm going to basically draw the same diagram that Matteo had on the board. Um, so there's one side of this, which is combinatorics. That's this side. There's another side of this, which is physics. So on the combinatorial side, we've got the moment map, which the exact definition isn't going to matter too much, so I'm just going to say the moment map is defined like this. <laughs> it's a map from the TNN Grassmannian to R to the N. Um, really, it's you can define it on the whole Grassmannian, but I'm just going to care about the TNN Grassmannian. And the image of the TNN Grassmannian under the moment map is this polytope called the hypersimplex. I'll give you um, a friendlier definition in a second. Matteo also gave you one. So what I'm going to say about this, this is a polytope. It's um, dimension n minus 1 sitting inside of Rn. OK, and this is, OK, so the, the moment map is something that's classically studied and um, combinatorialists really like thinking about moment map images of certain subsets of the Grassmannian. This is where um, matroid polytopes come from. OK, on the physics side, um, we've got this amplitudehedron map. Um, OK, and so it's, I want to emphasize that in the beginning, when you're defining the amplitudehedron, you have to pick a helper matrix Z from the very beginning. So Z is going to be an N by K plus 2 matrix with positive maximal minors. And um, I have to choose this in the beginning. And it's actually, um, it's widely believed, but not yet proved, that the, all the important features of the amplitudehedron don't depend on the matrix Z I picked. But so, yeah, I just want to emphasize, you do have to make this choice. OK, and this um, helper matrix Z uh, gives you a map on the TNN Grossmannian, just induced by matrix multiplication. And I'm going to call that map Z tilde. All right, so how does this work? I, I take my subspace represented by matrix A. And the Z tilde map will send it to a different subspace represented by the matrix A times Z. Um, right? So it's an image from TNN Grossmannian into another Grossmannian. And you might worry, like, oh no, what if A times Z is not full rank? Uh, but it is, it's all OK. Um, so the fact that I started with something in the TNN Grossmannian and my Z matrix had positive maximal minors, it means that this map is well defined. OK. And as Matteo said, the image of the um, Z tilde map is called the amplitudehedron. And in particular, I've, I've, I'm sticking with m equals 2 here, and, and that's why I've got a, I've like picked this particular dimension for my z matrix. OK. And so as Matteo mentioned, we are physicists are interested in um, computing the canonical form, some kind of differential form for this amplitudehedron. Um, but the amplitudehedron is a very complicated space, and we do not know how to compute it for the whole space. Instead, we know how to compute the canonical form for little pieces of this space, and then we can add them together to obtain the canonical form for the whole space. And so um, now we're going to talk about the little pieces. OK, so on um, the amplitudehedron side, um, I'm just going to take Z tilde images of closures of positroid cells, OK, because, well, you know, our, our natural domain is the totally non-negative Grassmannian. We already know how to split it up into pieces. So this is what we're going to take. Um, I'll call these grass topes. So the, um, the tope suffix does not mean this is a polytope. Um, it's a portmanteau of Grassman and polytope. That's uh, language of Thomas Lamb. And um, oh, yeah, I guess I, I should have said in the beginning. So. Right, these grass topes are not polytopes. They sit inside of this GRKK plus 2, and they can be full dimensional. Um, so what I, what I really want to say is I guess this thing is full dimensional, the amplitudehedron, i.e. it's 2K dimensional. OK. And um, in particular, we're interested in these grass topes because certain ones of them will know how to compute the canonical form already. OK, but on the hypersimplex side, we can make exactly the same definition, where instead of taking Z tilde images, I'm just going to take moment map images of positroid cells. And then what you get are positroid polytopes, which I'm going to denote by gamma m. And I'll give you, again, a friendlier definition of these things in a second.
Um, okay, so now on the physics side, we already know there are particular grass topes we're gonna pay attention to, and because these are the ones um, whose canonical forms we know and are useful for computing the canonical form for the whole amplitohedron. And um, I'm gonna call those special grass topes uh, positroid tiles. And these are going to be the full dimensional grass topes, so 2K dimensional, where the Z tilde map was injective on the positroid cell. And the injectivity assumption here is important for being able to compute the canonical form um, for these little pieces of the amplitohedron. So that's why we care about injectivity here. Okay, and then um, blindly pursuing this analogy for reasons that don't make any sense yet, I'm just going to define exactly the same thing on the hypersimplex side. So I, I am a positroid tile for the hypersimplex. Well, it's just going to be a full dimensional positroid polytope. So that means n minus one dimensional. Um, where the moment map was injective on the positroid cell. Okay, and then um, the notion we care about on the amplitohedron side is this notion of positroid tiling. So that's just a, a decomposition of the amplitohedron into these positroid tiles um, whose interiors are pairwise disjoint. So, and um, right, we want we want to cover the whole the whole amplitohedron. Okay, and again, I can make exactly the same definition on the hypersimplex side. A positroid tiling of the hypersimplex is going to be a decomposition of the hypersimplex as a union of these positroid tiles with disjoint interiors. Okay, and as a mathematician, you might be looking at this and thinking, okay, well, um, maybe on the combinatoric side, I was kind of game for the stuff up here, but then like, why did you start talking about this? Why should I care? Well, okay, so one thing is, um, it turns out these positroid tiles, they're a very natural subclass of positroid polytopes. Um, and if you wanna kind of under, understand why to care about positroid tilings, well, okay, so these tilings as a, as a special case, um, you'll get, it turns out you get, uh, certain nice sub, like polyhedral subdivisions of the hypersimplex. Um, so the notion of tiling is much looser than the notion of a polyhedral subdivision because we're not asking that the boundaries of these polytopes interact in any nice way. Um, so you should think of the positive tiling, it's a, it's a generalization of subdivision. Um, so we're, we're kind of moving to something maybe, uh, maybe less well governed, but it includes these nice polyhedral subdivisions as a special case. Okay, so, um, as Matteo has already told you, there's, there's some funny connection between these two things. Um, and before I give you more details, let me just make some stuff a bit more concrete. Um, and also uh, kind of impress upon you why we really like this mysterious connection. Um, so basically on the combinatorial side, we have a very concrete understanding of more or less everything that's going on. <laughs> um, so I defined everything as moment map images, but you can just give an intrinsic description of all of these polytopes just as some subset of Rn. I don't have to talk about a totally non-negative Grossmannian at all. Um, so yeah, I'm using the same notation as Matteo for E sub i is the indicator vector of the subset i. Okay, so the, the hypersimplex delta k plus one n is just, as Matteo said, it's the convex hull of all of the indicator vectors. So all the vectors with k plus one ones in them and the rest zeros. So here is um, the only hypersimplex I can draw. Um, it's a three-dimensional polytope sitting inside of R4, delta 2, 4. You can see that its vertices are indeed indexed by two element subsets of four. Okay, and then these positroid polytopes, so these were moment map images of positroid cell closures. Well, they're just some polytopes that sit inside of the hypersimplex. How do you get them? Well, the positroid polytope gamma M um, you just take the convex hull of all the indicator vectors for subsets in M, right? So, um, for example, here is a positroid polytope. I took my hypersimplex and I just threw away this vertex, took the convex hull of the rest. Um, if you want to think about it as moment map image of something, it's the moment map image of this positroid cell. Okay, and then just to remind people in the audience, um, positroid polytopes are special even among matroid polytopes, right? Not all matroids are positroids. So this is a matroid polytope, but not a positroid polytope. Okay, so we have good explicit definitions of most of the things on the previous slide. So next comes positroid tiles. Um, the positroid tiles, so these were 
full dimensional positroid polytopes where the moment map was injective, um, they just turn out to be the smallest full dimensional positroid polytopes. So when we're thinking about positroid tilings, we're just trying to break the hypersimplex up into positroid polytope pieces that are as small as possible. Right? We don't want to be able to refine this um, decomposition in any way. Okay, so that's good, very concrete. And then lastly, um, if, if you want, so if I want to produce some positroid tilings for you, I can actually do that. I can produce a ton of them. And I have a mathematical object in, a, in the background that is controlling their structure. So um, the, the positive Dressian, which is a polyhedral fan, um, its maximal cones are in bijection with these, with certain positroid tilings. It's in fact with the positroid tilings, which are subdivisions. So you should think of this as being a super nice story where we have some global object, um, right? We, we understand the secondary geometry here, basically. We have some fan sitting in the background and it's telling us, um, well, it's giving us lots of nice positroid tilings. Uh, it doesn't give us all of them, right? Because these are all going to be subdivisions, but it gives us a nice class. Okay, so this slide was to convince you that on the hypersimplex side, like everything, like the story is as good as possible, basically. Um, everything is linear. <laughs> we have lots of understanding. Um, and then kind of, as you know from Mateo's talk, we don't know so much on the amplitudehedron side, so like on the nonlinear side. Um, there are some cases in which I can tell you precisely what's going on, um, and these are the cases that Mateo kind of singled out. Um, so the first one is when k plus 2 is equal to n. And this situation is special because um, our helper matrix will be square, and so our z tilde map is just an isomorphism. Okay, so we know what's going on in that case. It turns out there's only, for dimension reasons, only one positroid tile, um, and so there's only one positroid tiling. Okay? Uh, the other situation where we know what's going on is for the special case k equals 1, and that's when the amplitudehedron is actually a polygon sitting inside of P2. And in that situation, our positroid tiles are literally just triangles, um, and our tilings are literally just triangulations, like Matteo said. And so, yeah, there we also know what's going on. But before our work, before that, uh, before our work, all other values of k, uh, it's kind of, okay, it's, we just don't really, yeah, we don't really know very much. Um, Bao and He gave a, recurs a recursive construction of some tilings of the amplitudehedron, um, but yeah, I don't know. It's recursive. We definitely don't have any global object in the background telling us anything about structure of tilings. Okay, so um, this was before our work, so now let me tell you what we know after our work. Um, so there's, <laughs> so Mateo kind of talked about this in uh, kind of, not giving that many details. I'm actually not going to give that many details either. <laughs> there is a mysterious correspondence called T-duality. <laughs> I have a slide at the very end if you want to know exactly what it is. Um, but I want to emphasize that this is a correspondence between positroids of one type. Um, so actually, type. Oops. So it's a correspondence between positroids of type k plus 1 comma n and some other positroids of type Kn. And whatever this map is, so it's combinatorially defined, someone hands me a positroid M of type k plus 1n, I will hand you the T dual positroid M hat of type Kn. Um, and the definition is not very complicated, but um, yeah, it's, a, it, it just, it's combinatorial, so there's some recipe by which I can produce one positroid from another. But um, given this way of matching up positroids, uh, or positroid cells giving inside of two different Grassmannians, um, you can also just say, okay, uh, okay, so yeah, sorry. So we have this way of matching up positroids of two different types. So that gives me a way of matching up positroid cells in two different Grassmannians. So SM is going to sit inside of TNN GR K plus 1N, and then SM hat is going to sit inside of GR KN. TNN part, and then I can also match up the images of these cells under the two maps, right? So I've got um, some positroid polytope, gamma M sitting inside of the hypersimplex, and then I've got the T-dual grass tope, or um, ZM hat, sitting inside of the amplitudehedron, NK comma 2. Okay, and uh, I haven't told you what this map is, so you're kind of like, okay, <laughs> whatever. But the point is, somehow, this combinatorially defined correspondence, um, so it was conjectured, and then we later proved, that this is exactly matching up 
um, those the, basically exactly matching up the structures that I defined for, on both sides. So um, if you have, okay, so Lukowski, Parisi, and Williams conjectured, and then later um, Matteo, Lorne, and I proved, you, the, some positroid polytope is a positroid tile for the hypersimplex if and only if the T-dual grass tope is a positroid tile for the amplitudehedron. So somehow the, like the good T-duality is matching up the good behavior of the moment map and the good behavior of this Z-tilde map. And even better, um, or kind of even further, they conjectured and we proved that um, some collection of positroid tiles for the hypersimplex gives a positroid tiling if and only if the T-dual collection of grass topes gives a positroid tiling of the amplitudehedron for all Z. So this T-duality is matching up good behavior of the maps on the two sides, and it's well-behaved with respect to these tilings as well. Um, and, okay, so why do we like something like this? Well, one is just really weird. <laughs> so it's very attractive because it's very strange. Um, but on, it's also attractive because... Um, well, as I tried to convince you earlier, we kind of know everything that's going on on the hypersimplex side. Um, we're just dealing with, uh, th things are convex, we're just dealing with like linear objects, you know, polytopes, and um, we, we don't have that kind of control on the amplitudehedron side, so something like this lets us port all of our knowledge from the hy hypersimplex side into the amplitudehedron side. Um, okay, and I, I should mention, um, Lukowski, Parisi, and Williams proved um, one direction of this, I think it's that was that direction, um, and they also provided some support um, for part two of this conjecture. Um, we we gave a the proof that Lauren Matteo and I gave of these two things was independent of uh, the other their original proof of this direction. Okay, yeah. Uh, Melissa, I, I think you said this and I missed it, but. Uh, what does it mean to be a positive tile? I mean, I would have guessed that every positive participates in a, in a tiling, but, but it sounds like you're saying that they don't. Yeah, so a positive tile is going to be a full dimensional positive polytope, which cannot be subdivided into smaller ones. So a maximal cell of a finest positive cell. Yeah, that's right. Um, and these are exactly, it turns out they'll be um, exactly the series parallel positroids. That's those positive polytopes. Yeah, that's. Um, so arrays in the crest. Sorry? Arrays in the positive crest. That's right. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, no, the arrays should be the coarsest ones, but these are the finest. Oh, these are the finest. Yeah. 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 Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So um, let me tell you, let me give you uh, a bit more detail about these two results. Um, I'm not sure how much I'm going to be able to tell you about the tilings result, but that's okay. I'm, feel free to ask questions during this. I'm not like married to getting all the way through all these slides. Okay. So, um, yeah, so like I said, our results are um, a proof of these two conjectures. Um, so we show that T duality gives a bijection between these positroid tiles for the hypersimplex and the positroid tiles for the amplitudehedron. But kind of what's even better is um, we give a very concrete inequality description of the tiles for the amplitudehedron. Um, so previously, the only definition we have for these subsets of the amplitudehedron is, well, there's Z tilde images of certain subsets of a TNN Grassmannian. And what we do is we give actually just a very concrete, like this is what ZM hat is as a subset of GRKK plus two. Um, and what's very interesting is that this inequality description exactly parallels the inequality description of the, posit the, the T-dual positroid polytope. Um, and so I emphasize to you that T-duality at this point is just a combinatorial map. It's like a way of matching up positroids. And this, is, this result is kind of some hint that there is some geometric content as well. <laughs> there should be, yeah, so there should be like some geometric way of going between these two things too. Okay, and then, yeah, the other part of our result is, um, well, the T-duality also induces a bijection between positroid tilings of the two spaces. Okay. So, um, I, so I'm about to give you an inequality description um, for the positroid tiles of the two sides. And um, as a combinatorialist, I like to be able to read my inequalities off of some combinatorial object. So that's what I'm about to do. So one of the things we show is that positroid tiles on both sides are in bijection with some very simple combinatorial pictures, um, which look like this. 
So they are properly bicolored subdivisions of an n-gon with area k. Um, okay, so subdivision, uh, I think most people in the audience should know what this means. So you take, you take the polygon, you draw some diagonals in the polygon, but not all. Properly bicolored means I'm going to color the pieces of this subdivision black or white, and I shouldn't have um, any pieces of the same color sharing an edge. This area K statistic is just recording um, how much of my polygon I have colored black. So to compute it, what I do is I'm going to triangulate my polygon, and then I will count the number of black triangles I see. Okay, and so from a picture like this, I'm going to tell you an inequality description for a positroid tile in the amplitudehedron, and then also a positroid tile um, in the hypersimplex, and those will be the t-dual positroid tiles. Okay, so I'm going to focus on, okay, so from this picture, I want to produce some inequalities in GRKK plus 2, describing this tile. And those inequalities, um, they're not in Pluger coordinates. Uh, instead, they're in some linear functions of Pluger coordinates called twister coordinates. So let me tell you what those are quickly. Um, so pick some y in GRKK plus 2, look where the amplitude hedron lives, and um, let zi denote the i-th row of z. Um, the twister coordinate yij is just the determinant of the matrix where I put y on the top and then the i-th row of z and then the j-th row of z. So this is an n by n matrix. Um, oh, sorry, k, k plus 2 by k plus 2 matrix, <laughs> and I can take its determinant. Um, okay, and it's just, so this twister coordinate, it's just some linear function in the Pluger coordinates of y. Um, and I'll just say, uh, we didn't come up with these out of nowhere. Um, they've kind of been floating around for a while as good functions to use to describe the amphitohedron. Um, in particular, there's a conjecture of Arkani, Hamid, Thomas, and Trinko, which I'm just going to flash about how to describe the amphitohedron in terms of twister coordinates. And um, this will come back later. It's something we're able to prove. Okay, so we've got these twister coordinates. There's certain linear functions in Pluckers. Um, so here's how you get a tile. So you start with your properly bicolored subdivision, um, and you choose a triangulation of the black polygons in your subdivision, so something like this. And now um, I'm going to have one inequality for each arc of a black triangle in this triangulation. Okay, and those inequalities are just going to tell me about signs of twister coordinates. So I'll just do this by example. So let me pick an arc of a black triangle. So maybe I pick one to four. Um, so from this picture, I will read off the sign of the twister coordinate y14. So negative one to the something times y14 is positive. And this sign is really easy. Um, it's, it's just going to be the area from i to j, so from one to four. What is the area? Well, I look at this arc, and then I just count the number of black triangles I see to the left. So area i to j equals number of black triangles to the left. Oh, and I should say I'm always orienting my arcs from smaller number to bigger number. Okay, so here um, I only I see a single black triangle to the left of 1 to 4, and so my exponent here should be 1. So my inequality is that the twister coordinate y14 is negative. And I just do this for all of the arcs of black triangles I see. That collection of inequalities cuts out um, my positroid tile. And... Question? Yeah. So what was the, the result is... Which was the result here? Because uh, I, I remember there was a formula of uh, David Spire. He did something like this too, right? In this tropical linear series. So all of this is happening inside of the amplitohedron. Okay. So, so this is a tile inside of the amplitohedron. So, uh, so this. So you, okay. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. So the no, the no. z is supposed to tell you that we took the z okay. tilde. No, image. no, no, no. Yeah, yeah. I'm, 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 <laughs> no. Blind, I'm blind. to. <laughs> no, no. This is my, this is the next thing I'm going to say. Actually, yeah. Okay, okay. So, so don't worry too much. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So this is about amplitohedron positroid tiles, and um, yeah, it follows from work of Spire that, um, well. Yeah, so here I'll, I'll show you what to do for um, what to do for the 
repository tiles in the hypersimplex, so those are just positroid polytopes, and this does follow from work of Spire. It's, uh, you, yeah, you, you can phrase it in many different ways, but yeah, it follows from what he did in his tropical linear spaces paper. Okay, so, um, okay, so I, I told you how to get the inequalities for the positroid tile and the amplitude hedron. Now I want the inequalities for the T-dual positroid polytope. And um, what's cool is that I'm going to use the same combinatorial object and even the same statistic to arrive at those inequalities. Okay, so if I want the positroid tile in the hypersimplex, what I should do um, is I should take this same area statistic and I just use it as a bound on sums of consecutive coordinates. And so... Yeah, so it's it's not, I mean, these inequalities are not the same, right? So this is something about um, being on, like, one side of a certain hyperplane. And then um, this is about bounding coordinate sums between two things, but the combinatorial data I'm using to define these inequalities is identical, and even the statistic. Um, yeah, okay, so as you can imagine, um, having this kind of very concrete description of what the positroid tiles are in the amphitrohedron, well, it helps you prove a lot of things. <laughs> um, so one thing that we're able to prove is this description of the amphitrohedron in terms of twister coordinates. So this is um, the formula that was conjectured by Arkani Hamid, Thomas, and Trinka. Um, okay, so this says that the amphitrohedron is the closure of all those points in the Grossmannian where n twister coordinates are positive and a particular sequence of twister coordinates has k sign changes. So um, you should think of this part as being like very polytopal, right? I'm just saying I'm on a certain side of a bunch of hyperplanes. And then, well, this part's not polytopal, it's saying I'm inside some Grassmannian. <laughs> and then this part is uh, less polytopal and kind of mysterious. Some particular sequence has k sign changes. Um, and yeah, I should also say that Arkani Hamid, Thomas, and Trinka proved one direction of this inclusion um, this one. Okay. And um, we also get some more stuff out of this related to cluster algebras. I think that is not this audience, so I'm not really going to say anything. If you're interested in this, talk to me afterwards. I can tell you more. Um, okay. And then in the last 10 minutes, I want to talk about our tilings result, um, which kind of introduces even more connections between the hypersimplex and the m equals 2 amplitudehedron. Okay, so just to remind you, positroid tilings on the two sides, um, we're decomposing our big space into these positroid tiles so that interiors are disjoint, um, right? And the union of the tiles is the whole thing. Um, so here's an example of a positroid tiling for the hypersimplex, and here's one for the k equals 1, m equals 2 amplitudehedron. Okay, and um, right, our result is that t-duality induces a bijection between these two things. Um, right, so here's a picture. So this is the same picture that Mateo showed, actually. It's the only one we can draw. <laughs> um, and so our proof technique here is, um, well, on both sides, we're going to take the simultaneous refinement of all positroid tilings. So that's going to break up the big spaces into smaller pieces on the two sides. And then we kind of cross our fingers and hope that those smaller pieces match up in some nice way. Um, and it's kind of interesting, this actually doesn't really happen, but uh, it happens enough for us to prove the theorem. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll qualify that statement a bit more. Okay, so um, let's start with the hypersimplex side. So I'm, I'm taking uh, the simultaneous refinement of all of these positroid tilings, and when you do that, you actually get something classical. Um, you get uh, an honest triangulation of the hypersimplex, so a decomposition into simplices. And this was studied in, under kind of various guises by <coughs> Stanley, um, Berend, and Lem and Posnikov, all kind of in different language. <coughs> okay, so you've got the hypersimplex, you've broken it up into simplices, um, and these maximal simplices, they're indexed by uh, permutations of n minus 1 with k descents, so they're Eulerian number, many of them. And I'm going to denote those maximal simplices by delta w, W is one of these permutations of n minus 1 with k descents. Okay, so this is the kind of decomposition we want to see on the amplitudehedron side, um, some decomposition into Eulerian number many pieces. Okay, well, on the amplitudehedron side, um, okay, so remember, um, on the amplitudehedron, our positroid tiles, they're cut out by saying certain twister coordinates have a specified sign. So if I take the simultaneous refinement of all positroid tilings, 
um, the little pieces that I'm left with, that's going to be the places where all twister coordinates have a specified sign, right? Because I'm saying like which side of each one of these twister coordinate hypersurfaces, hyperplanes they live on. Okay, so those are the little pieces we get of the amplitudehedron. So um, we're gonna pick some signs for each twister coordinate, and then we're gonna say, um, we're gonna define some sign chambers, delta hat epsilon, which is just all those points in the amplitudehedron where the twister coordinates have the signs specified by my, my epsilon vector. Okay, so you might be worried here because I've just defined really quite a lot of sign chambers, <laughs> um, right? I, I've got many, many sign vectors and a sign chamber for each of them. And I'm trying to get a decomposition into Eulerian number many pieces. Uh, but all is not lost. These twister coordinates are not algebraically independent. And so a lot of these sign chambers are empty, right? I can't just take all twister coordinates and willy-nilly assign signs to them. I won't always have a point satisfying um, that assignment. Um, yeah, so, so it is true that the amplitudehedron is the union of all of these many, many sign chambers, but many of the sign chambers are empty. And so the hope is kind of exactly the correct number of them are non-empty so that we can match up with this kind of decomposition of the hypersimplex. Okay, and um, okay, so kind of with this in mind, um, we're gonna take each W simplex in the hypersimplex and define a T dual W sign chamber in the amplitudehedron and then hope that these will be the non-empty ones. And um, okay, there's, there's kind of some mess here. <laughs> uh, so all I'm gonna say is the, the T dual W chamber to a particular W simplex, well, at some points in GRKK plus two, where twister coordinate signs can be read off of some statistic of the permutation W in some fairly straightforward way. It's just the formula looks kind of horrible. Okay, um, so yeah, here's, here's an example. Um, here is a W simplex in the hypersimplex, so this green stuff, and then the T dual W chamber is this green triangle inside of the amplitudehedron. Okay, so, um, Everything is nice, I mean, as you might expect, since we actually managed to prove the theorem. <laughs> um, so it turns out that these W chambers, um, they do cover all of the non-empty sign chambers. So the amplitudehedron is really the union of these uh, W chambers. And um, we kind of have the correct relationship between we have the like relationship predicted by T duality between inclusion of like a W simplex in a positroid polytope and inclusion of a W chamber inside of a grass tope, a positroid tile. Um, yeah, so that is to say, okay, so as long as your selected W chamber is non-empty and you pick some positroid tile for the amplitudehedron, that W chamber sits inside of that positroid tile if and only if the W simplex lies inside of the T dual positroid tile inside the hypersimplex. So basically everything in the world is happening nicely. T duality, again, kind of combinatorially defined, seems to be matching up things really well between the hypersimplex and the amphitopedron. But there's one problem, and that is this assumption for all W chambers that are non-empty. So it turns out um, that if whether or not a W chamber is empty depends on your choice of Z. And this is like the first time we've ever seen this kind of phenomenon in the amplitudehedron. Everything so far seemed to be really not dependent at all on the choice of Z, but this really definitely does. Um, so let's, let's see a little bit why this is happening. So let's just think about the K equals one case, um, N equals six. So my amplitudehedron is just a polytope, sorry, a polygon sitting inside of P2. It's a hexagon and its vertices are the rows of Z. Okay. So what are these W chambers? Well, um, the hypersurfaces, a certain twister, like twister coordinate YIJ is positive. In this situation, like say Y14 is positive, that's just telling me that my point Y must lie on a certain side of this diagonal. Um, like maybe it needs to lie on that one. Okay, so to see these W chambers, all I need to do is I need to draw every diagonal of this polygon and then uh, remove those diagonals and the connected components of the complement, that will be the W chamber. Okay, so let's think about this particular W chamber, the one in purple. So, you know, it's on uh, that side of the one four 
diagonal and on that side of the 3, 6 diagonal and on that side of the 2, 5 diagonal. Okay, and that's the, that's the definition of the W chamber. But the problem is, is that as I move, for example, Z1 over um, this diagonal, the 1, 4 diagonal, it will cross this point. And so the W chamber will be empty. And there's, yeah, I don't know, there's just like no way around it. This really, it depends a lot on Z. Um, but kind of the saving grace is that for each particular W chamber, you can pick a Z so that that W chamber is non-empty for that particular value of Z. But you really, you can't realize them all at once. Um, so there's no choice of Z that works for all of them. Um, yeah, and that's kind of what you need uh, to show the result about tie lengths. Um, it's also why we only pick up the tie lengths for the amphitrochedron that work for all Z. Um, the a priori, there could be kind of like sporadic tilings, which like work for some Z and not for others, and those don't relate to any, any sort of thing on the hypothesis. Um, okay, so I have some more questions, but I'll just leave them up and I'll end here. Thanks for listening. Thank you.